So, I mean, the, the typical way somebody would install DHS to 10 years ago, and frighteningly still today is quite common, is they will get themselves hopefully a Linux machine, but not necessarily, and then start looking through what's in the installation guide and go, that, get install this, install that, install the other. And they would create what I like to think of as a work of art. Right? Everything works. And it's all running on the same machine, the database and the Tomcat and all of that. Um, there's no real monitoring on it, so you don't actually know what's happening. But it seems to be working on the front end. Um, then over time, as systems get bigger, or you're running more than one system. Maintaining these works of art, really these works of art, they are not just the work of a single person, because the guy who set it up a few years back has since left, and now someone new has arrived, and they've tinkered a little bit more with it. Um, you end up with systems which are really, really hard to maintain on the one hand, to secure, really, really hard to secure, which is something that should be concerning all of us, if we're running tracker systems in particular. Even aggregate systems, people tend to think there's not much security to worry about aggregate systems, but I mean, a lot of folk are sitting there with 30,000 users in that system, right, with all their telephone numbers and what have you. There is information to protect in an aggregate system as well. Um, so Tito is going to be showing us a little bit about some of the ways in which we try to avoid creating these works of art and we create implementations particularly in, a, in an automated way. It's really important for disaster recovery when you need to set up again. It's the kind of thing that prevents people from upgrading. We hear a lot about people are reluctant to upgrade. And part of the reason they're reluctant to upgrade because we tell them, look, don't upgrade your production server. Right? Do it on a staging instance or something first. And they go, hey, but it took three years to create that production server. It will take me another three years to create the staging server to setting up an environment should be a 15-minute job. Always. That's important for disaster recovery. It's important for being able to quickly spin up instances. And Tito hopefully will show us some some ideas about that. Give me one second. Um, yeah, and also backups. Um, it's frightening. And I, I, I get to see quite a lot of implementations. I don't know. Love, I, I, it's a little bit like, you know the movie Pulp Fiction? Uh, the guys get shot in the back of the car and blood all over the place. And then they call in the wolf to come and clean up the mess. I tend to do a lot of that, right? I, I only ever see implementation when they're, when they're a total mess. Blood is on the floor. Everybody's fighting with each other. And the system has been hacked and all what have you. Um, we do get into mess sometimes. And sometimes it's because it's inexperienced people doing it. Sometimes it's because the system has just got too big and hasn't been provisioned properly. One of the more difficult messes we've seen a lot of over the last two or three years, people are running out of disk space, they're running out of disk space, so they start removing all their backups so that they've got more disk space, um, and then systems crash. There was a case, I don't want to say who and where, but there was a case where some, some country lost its vaccination papers. It didn't have backup. There's been a few similar cases where databases have just crashed and, and the backups have either been inadequate or, or, or too old or whatever. So we need to think much more about backing up simply because we are dealing with systems which are sometimes sometimes a bit unmanageable, right? They, they just get outside of our control and sometimes they will do things that we don't expect. And at some stage, you're going to have to resort to a backup. It used to be that folk would have an automated, if they're doing good practice, they have an automated nightly back. Every 24 hours, you have a little script, runs out of Chrome, whatever it is, makes the backup. 
puts it on the local disk. Ideally, you get it off the local disk as quickly as you can, you put it somewhere safer and cheaper, because that disk is expensive, right? your database disk. But if they were doing that, it would be, at least you have some kind of automated backup. But the problem is, and that was good enough, I think, for most aggregate systems. The tracker system is not really good enough. Because if you've got a clinical system, or even a vaccination registry has become a big thing it's been a few years back. If you've got a system which crashes at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, then the best thing you can do is restore the backup from 8 o'clock last night. You lost a lot of data. And that's potentially critically important data. We want to more and more move to a way of doing backups where you have zero data loss if the, if the system goes down. It's actually possible to do, it wasn't possible this time last year. It is possible to do now by um, using streaming backups, Postgres, you can use the Postgres database, it creates well logs, and all you need to do is just keep hold of all the well logs, and you can replay them again. Um, we demonstrated that working about a month ago on one of Tito's polls. But that's a situation that we more and more want to get to. That's not really about managing complexity, but it's more about managing the aftermath, right, of not managing the complexity. Look, I don't want to talk too long. I know that Tito has some slides prepared, and Ulav has some slides prepared. If anybody hasn't read it, I really suggest you have a look at Google it, the big ball of mud, for an architectural pattern as I think it's probably the best description of um, the way we do implementations. We create these big balls of mud, which have all kinds of strange features, you know, hard to maintain. And we don't do it, people don't do it because they're stupid. People are rational. It's like you walk around Oslo, the housing is all really well planned, right? There's nice flats and apartments, and there's a metro system, and there's walkways and cycleways. We know how to plan towns. But still, the majority of the world don't live in towns like that. Right? They live in informal settlements, by and large, in urban environments. Um, there are forces that make people do that. They don't do that because they're irrational. And it's the same thing with our DHS. A lot of our DHS2 implementations, I think they resemble more informal settlements than they resemble well-planned towns. And hopefully, we get a few tips and tricks this morning. Um, so, Tito, are you going to go? Tito is our, which is no longer new. Tito's been with us two years now. Tito's our server admin support guy. So, if you have problems with your server implementation, looking for tips and tricks about how you might do things better or tooling, Tito is the man to talk to. Will you talk a little bit, Tito, about your Thursday call? Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, First, um, I'm going to start introducing myself. Um, my name is Tito, and I am with a uh, server support team uh, together with Bob and uh, Babuka, although he's not here today. So I'm here to talk about server and um, server hosting um, with regard to the complex systems. Yeah, so... Um, what is complex? Um, complex is just the opposite of uh, simple. And we all know that most of the deployments that we have on site, production setups, some of them are complex. And that is why I'm going to talk us through the um, things that you need to do if you have these um, complex setups. So if you have these setups that are complex, uh, then you want to manage um, risks that come, that are associated with these systems. And the key thing that we want to, to be taking care of is the, is the data. And also, uh, in most cases, you, you could be having a system that, uh, that is not performing the way you, you, you expect. Yeah? Uh, maybe it's having performance issues and what are the things that you need to do prior to, to that, you know? Uh, and there are things that you need to 
incorporate into the the planning initially uh before you go live on production and one of it is monitoring yeah and another one is backups right so um usually th those are not the core dhis2 components you can run an instance without a backup plan you can run an instance without uh monitoring uh in it right it it works and sometimes you you don't you don't care so much about do those two components it's only until you have a crash system crash is when you you start thinking you wished you had backups right or you have a system that is not performing well and 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 it's slow right is when you know that you needed to have had um monitoring so those are the two things that i'm gonna be talking about today so <clears throat> we all know that um we we want to know how our system is performing in terms of um how how well it responds um and and sometimes it doesn't work the way we expected and we need tools that helps us troubleshooting and in most cases also before you even go live or setting up your system you want to plan better uh resources that you need uh the server that you you would want to run your instance on uh, you don't know you know beforehand that uh, how many you know the resources that you want so um what we usually advise people is that they could have a system you know maybe that they are getting it from the from the cloud environment and then they they have monitoring plugged into that system and then they make informed decisions later on um whether they they would want to uh scale scale it up or down um and then um what once you have your system up, up and running uh, sometimes you have um you you want to to have a better way of dealing with um issues incident response and remediation remediations and then also you want to improve performance and also uh security monitoring so um we we want to choose the right monitoring tool to do the job and as a server support team we we advising people usually to have two levels of monitoring one is the the server the system that you are running you know the host you want to monitor your host and also the application itself the dhis2 instance so for server monitoring um we 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 there are out out there there are open source tools that you can you can use uh and the main ones that we usually um deploy is munin and subix they are open source tools you freely available for your for your use case and in most cases it gives it gives you most of the information that you need for troubleshooting purposes for resource planning and so forth glow root uh comes handy when you're having performance issues in 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 a dhs2 instance and it helps you really get to the root cause of the problem um and in most cases when we are asked or we have issues from the from the site um about a slow system we usually advise people just to get glowroot up and running fast and then from there we can help them do troubleshooting and be able to find where the problems are but <clears throat> most of the deployments especially those that people do set up manually um are not are not uh, they, they're not incorporating these tools you know um they're just setting up, they're just getting the hs2 up and running and when they're having issues is when they get these tools um after we ask them to you know deploy them yeah so the choice bet between zabbix and and munin yeah so munin is simple uh, setting it up is very simple and it gets job done it has all the graphs that you need um but if you want um extensive capabilities alerting user management dashboards then subix is um is a better tool to use but again it comes with its own complexities it's difficult to set it up it 
you know, it's not just uh, straightforward as Munin. So that is the reason why we have even Munin um, set up by default using the tools that we have uh, in our deployments. Uh, and then another component that is very important is backups, yeah? Because it's not just about uh, having a working DHS2 system, but you also need to have a plan uh, in case anything happens, a disaster happens. And th there's so many, uh, you know, scenarios where you could have your system not accessible. Um, the hardware-related issues, uh, software um corruption and so forth, accidental, accidental deletion, um, even ransomware is, is also common nowadays. You know, you can have your whole virtual machine uh, encrypted and you need that key to have your data back. You also have fired, um, you know, natural disasters like fire and, and so forth. So you need to have a plan beforehand of things that can happen you know, in the, in the, and it's a, it's just a, a backup plan that you need to have before you even have your system uh, up and running. So <clears throat> we have, you know, explaining backups even more, uh, we have um, uh, recovery point objective and recovery, recovery time objective. Uh, and then we have a disaster here, right? So um, recovery point is where you want to fall back to in case um, you have a disaster. Um, and we usually have backup script that is doing backups daily. And then um, we have a retention policy, uh, which says, which tells us how many backup uh, copies we want to have maybe seven daily backups, uh, four weekly backups, and maybe two monthly backups. That's uh, a retention policy. Uh, so when a disaster happens um, and you have data loss, so you fall back to a recovery point. Maybe it's a daily backup, so you fall back to yesterday, right? So that is your recovery point. But that is not helping if you have a highly transactional um, data like uh, tracker, which changes like every minute. Right. Um, so you want to have in that case a very short um, recovery point objective, maybe an hour or even a few minutes back. And then sometimes you have backup and then you pushing it somewhere. Maybe it's a it's an S3 bucket or another remote server that you're just using it for backup purposes. Um, and when the disaster happens, you want to get that data to your 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 setup that you now you know trying to come back live, and um, and the time that it takes for you to get that backup file and restore in a, in a new system is is called a recovery time objective, yeah. And it depends on um, other factors also, how you did your backup initially, where you're storing your backup the speed, you know, the, the, the network speed that you have between your new server and where you have your backup, yeah? It can take even more than two hours just to get a backup wherever you have to your, your new server. So, and maybe your database is huge. It also takes a while to have it restore to the new database. So you want to minimize also this uh, recovery time, the time that you take to come back live in case of this disaster, right? And that informs what the, 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 the strategies that you use to do your backups, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> just having backup is one thing and, and, and storing the backup is something else also because you want to keep, you want to keep your backup safe somewhere else. Um, in most of the implementations that we, we've seen, you know, uh, people, would want to keep their data within their, their country. They don't want to stay, so it's somewhere else, maybe cloud, because of the policies. And in that case, they are storing them in another server, maybe running in an offsite. Maybe this is your main site, and then they have the, the, the data offsite. Um, in that case, you would need a good network if, if your backup dump 
is huge, then you need a, a good network. Also, if you are doing um, uh, incremental backups, maybe you are you're, you're archiving while logs offsite, uh, you don't need a um, high latency link between your main site and the, and the offsite. It needs to be very low latency link. And um, there's an aspect of also security of your backups, uh, whether you trust the offsite enough to just have plain backups there without encryption or if you don't trust then you have to encrypt your 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 backup file and then that gives you another responsibility of even keeping the encryption keys and so forth yeah so if you have you know if you don't have a site remote remote site to store your backup then it's better to have it locally also right um because you could have a, a, a deletion, accidental deletion of your data uh, although um you can all, it happens you can even delete the whole database right it has happened before so you, you need to have also something that you can fall back to in case you things like that one happens locally um it's not secure but it's just better to have even local backups than just not having anything at all. Um, other deployments are storing their backups offsite uh, using object storage, S3 compatible. You know, um, most of the cloud providers out there support um, object storage uh, S3, and they are not expensive. Yeah, uh, um, uh, and you can even encrypt your backups locally and then move them to the to the s3 bucket if if um yeah so <clears throat> and then um how are we helping um simplify these complex setups we have tools uh deployment tools um they were initially bash scripts but we translated to be ansible based scripts and um Two reasons. One, one is we wanted to support um, uh, not just set up within a single server, but um, in a in a in a in a multiple server uh, architecture using SSH connection um, to do the setup. And um, the tools gives you not only the 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 DHS two instance working, but also the tools. Yeah, it gives you the monitoring tools for both uh, DHS2 instance and the system that you have your DHS2 running. And um, it, it also deploys a backup script, which is by default going to do dumps within the, the disk, the local disk that you have, which you can also customize in case you have maybe um, a fast disk that you want to just have it dedicated for PostgreSQL and a slow disk that you want just just want to be doing backups to uh, you can have uh, you can further further customize that uh, backup script um, if you have an S3 um, endpoint uh, then you can also configure uh, Ansible so that it generates um, a backup script that pushes your backups uh, remotely uh, we also have weekly calls uh, that any anybody can join. It's an open call that we have every Thursday um, to uh, build the community around uh, DHIS2 server uh, support team around the world. And I know most of you, uh, some of you are usually joining those calls. And we talk about uh, uh, the, the real deployments that we have. We usually have people sharing with us what they have, issues that they are facing, and helping them um, wherever we can to support them solve those issues. Yeah, this is the end of the slide. Um, or we could jump straight into the method. I think that is a good idea. Let's take five minutes reflection on people's various challenges relating to what they do with their service and maybe some ideas which have been stimulated.
I can see the usual culprits. <laughs> Jason, you were first. Yeah. So um, we we are actually th there were issues with the uh, with the um, with the uh, with the bash tools tools energy. Two issues. One is that it was only uh, working if you have just a single server and you want to deploy the instance within that single server. However, we noticed that country deployments, they have separate database, they have separate application server and proxy. We wanted to support that kind of an environment, right? So we moved to Ansible tools because you can connect to these multiple servers via SSH and do your deployments sitting in a, in a deployment server, right? Number two also is that uh, bash tools um, were not idempotent. You could run it once and then you try to repeat, you get errors, right? And the, the way Bob deal, dealt with that is he had a separate uh, deploy.war uh, script that after running his initial deployment, he would come back later and create instance and deploy war separately without necessarily starting afresh. But with Ansible, you can rerun the whole script. Nothing happens if changes have been made already. And the only new changes that are introduced are going to be done that. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, okay. Let me. I, uh, it, you've described more of the kind of functions of this, but, but I'm wondering uh, what should we do going forward? Yeah, so, so Tito's just trying to say that these tools are better than one. <laughs> which, 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 heck, they are. This is everything that was happening with the whole team. If you are still, and I know there are lots of settings in there. We try to make sure that it keeps working. We try to make sure that it's. If you're going to do a new deployment, it's probably advisable not to. If you have an opportunity, you're going to do a major upgrade or something. Take the opportunity to do it. There's all other innovative new stuff we do have to do. Yeah. Yeah. First thing I heard was you and you and you. The, the, and my question was that uh, you have a recommendation of uh, testing before restoring backlog because the recommendation is most of the time to get a site on uh, object uh, store based S3. Challenge when we get on on premise or deadlines like how are we going to test the restoration? How are we going to the value of those offsite data and how we can like create crazy situation that doesn't burning server crashing or being like that. Uh, the value that we can we're used to run to try that. Yeah, I think what we recommend is that we have an excellent with this kind. Ideally, what you want to have is a separate server in your local environment, right? So you go back up, so it's the first thing. And one reason being that you want to pull your backups from the database rather than push them to the monitor. Push them to the archive, it means if you have a malicious actor attacks your production system, it's also got access to your archive. Right? It's better to pull. So you want to have a Dedicated backup server, archive server. Then you need to kind of think about what are the thing, useful things to have on that server. This is because once you have the backups and you have the server, 
might as well be testing backups. If you don't know that you have a good backup until you test it. I think we have inspected out where we've done a few works of art on it. Creates a backup, so it has the pool script for putting the backups and also the test script for testing the backups. You will say that one of the problems people are finding, sometimes people are thinking, Sometimes a database of restoration can take eight months. That puts people off testing. But um, particularly to factor your time for not doing it. Let's create a test environment, we still need a backup, we need to send it. That's another reason to start looking at post case between binary backups and this. They use a bit more disk space, but it's really designed for very, very large databases. Pages on the disk, people do. I would say if you're, look, look, you're working with very, very big databases, then this PG dump approach, it's a little bit too naive. Really want to get. If you do base backups, then you can also archive the elements. Yeah, we, I think we'll put all of that to the There's one more that we will I'm from Pakistan, and uh, we are using DHS for IDSR. And we have National Institute of Health, and there we have a complete data center over there. And we have implemented ESXi, and we have vCenter center cluster over there. And for the backup purposes, we are using Veeam backup and replication, right? Uh, with Veeam backup and replication, uh, we are replicating our VM to other servers in the cluster as well. And we are taking two backups, uh, offline backups as well, uh, via the game. I think uh, that's the good way for us, and this is quite working for us as well. So um, my question is that, like, if you guys have reported any errors from from the country where there someone is using Veeam or the vCenter, just for just for them to say, I don't want to ask this question. Do you have a folk? If you want to have geeky discussions. Tito is sitting on a desk every day from four to five down there. Uh, come and share your experiences. I've been sitting here now and coupling you more. But my, my problem is that I've like quite a big, vague topic. So I started very broad thinking what should we talk about here? Then trying to narrow down, narrow down, stealing stuff from Jason, for example. And I think uh, this uh, the latest. Um, yeah, so I'll. Um, oh. Uh, yeah, so I'll talk mostly about uh, metadata stuff, metadata governments, uh, maintenance, a bit, also a bit broader about uh, change management within the, like the HS2 environment. How do you actually, when you're changing your metadata, um, how do you apply those changes in a secure way on your production uh, system? Uh, and finally, just a little bit around uh, upgrading DHIS2 versions. So that's sort of the, the agenda. Just one thing I was thinking of after seeing the app finalists yesterday is all of them are actually dealing with uh, 
metadata this year. It's about uh, assigning data sets. It's about creating uh, data sets. It's about syncing metadata. So it's sort of, uh, e even in the app competition, it's all about this metadata management in different ways uh, this year. No, I was um, uh, not involved. Uh, so I won't talk about sort of the DHS2 governance broadly, but just a little bit around the specifically as it relates to metadata. I think it's important to think of the governance and think of how this is sort of operationalized through SOPs um, that is available for all the people who are managing the system, uh, whether it's like the national core team or if it's users at the district level who are managing their own sort of local users. Uh, I think as in complexity increases, I think having this sort of in writing, what are, what is our sort of approach to managing users? How do we group them? How do we assign the different uh, authorities? What is the approach for changing org units? What is our approach to doing upgrades? Uh, as the sort of complexity of the environment grows, these things become even more important to have in place, I think. Um, that's just uh, some general intro. Because you have all these uh, questions around the governance. Who in your sort of organization, whether it's the Ministry of Health or uh, NGO or something else, who decides when should we operate? Who decides should we this famous controversial topic of saving zero values in your aggregate forms? Who decides whether you should do that or not? Who decides about the hosting? Who decides your definition of metadata? If you have multiple instances that are supposed to communicate, who decides what is our definition of the different data elements, variables? And who defines these SOPs for user management, or unit management? So I think these are just some examples of things that you really need to think through and uh, decide on uh, for the implementation. Now I'm just talking about a few things that it sort of seems very simple and basic and sort of not something we should talk about in a session on complex environment. But what we often see looking at DHS2 databases is that this is a big problem uh, a lot of places. Things like the naming, having a naming convention uh, that is consistent and used by all the people who work on the Metadata, uh, so you have like some common uh, common way of defining these things. You're consistent when you're dealing with HD aggregations, for example, using the same format. Thinking of people using the data in the end when you're setting up the names, not just of the people entering data. Uh, it's very tempting when you're defining a data set in DHIS2 to look at the Excel file or paper form that you're defining, and then you're just using those fields as your data element names. Uh, but then when someone uh, later opens the data visualizer and tries to find malaria cases, if you just use the title on the form, it will be very difficult. Um, so the point here is not to say that everyone has to follow these kind of Personally, and I see number of at the beginning of every data element name, for example, I, I become very uh, upset. But this is not to say that everyone has to do this, but every implementation should have some naming convention that they uh, agree on, and the people who configure metadata uh, applies. Uh, so just an example of on the on the left there, you try to find the find something in this list, uh, very difficult, uh, versus having some sort of prefix, uh, having like a concise naming, having maybe some postfix indicating that these are percentages and not jump numbers. Which, what were you referring to? The indicators um, have different revisions on, on the left, on, on the right. So, can we talk more about that and how to address that? Versioning? Yeah. I'm, I'm sort of, I don't have an answer for you. 
Uh, so I'm sort of tempted to say maybe that's a topic we should discuss like at the end, if uh, when we have some time at the end, because I think it's a big issue everywhere where you had DHIs for 10 years, you will have this kind of, okay, so we had one definition here and then we changed it slightly. We changed our data collection forms. It's more or less the same thing, but slightly different. Um, but maybe that's something we can save uh, for a discussion towards the end. Uh, if I'm efficient here with um, going through this. But I do think in some cases, uh, this grouping, again, it's sort of a very fundamental thing that it's useful to add your data elements, your indicators in data element indicator groups. Uh, and maybe add your groups to group sets, uh, which is both for sort of organizing your data so people can choose a group and find the stuff they're looking for in the visualization apps, but also because the groups and the group sets can be used uh, as data dimensions. And here I think it's when you talk about the revisions. This is one sort of thing that you could leverage uh, for example, if you have data collected with certain HD aggregation, and then you revise the form, you have a slightly more granular HD aggregations. You could use then uh, this category option group sets and groups, for example, to make some sort of broader H groups that can be applied to both old and the new data. There are some. For some things, it's possible to use these groupings. So you could, I guess, in depending on the use case, use data element group sets and groups in the same way to sort of harmonize your uh, harmonize the data for analytics, at least. Yeah, and this just some example though. Certain things here are primarily grouped because we want to use them in the end user apps to identify stuff. Other things we also or only use for uh, analytics to add dimensionality to the, the data. OK, so final topic related to the metadata is around the data integrity and metadata maintenance. Uh, so I'm sure many of you have seen uh, the data integrity check function in DHIS2. Many have also probably given up on using it uh, because it often fails in large databases. Uh, but I think this is uh, a topic that is very important as your system uh, yeah. one of my kids was in that kindergarten. Very exciting, <laughs> youngsters. Uh, but I think this is something that is really key uh, to look at routinely to monitor your uh, metadata integrity. Uh, and as David presented yesterday, there is actually now a new version of this data integrity checks, which is both faster and better and includes more stuff. So some of you have maybe seen the Metadata R tool that Jason has developed uh, it has been around for a couple of years. And that was sort of a prototype for what is now in core with uh, this new data integrity functionality. So I think if you haven't looked at it, it's the back end is available, I think, from 40, the front end app from 41. So that's something you really should look at. Um, and that now picks up lots of issues with your metadata integrity about groupings, about invalid category option combination um, structures, etc. But it doesn't pick up everything. So you still also need to do manual reviews of the metadata. Uh, yeah, so like I said, this is quite new. Um, we now have this a lot more flexible app with more stuff instead of this old one that often timed out on big uh, big systems. What is also interesting with the new uh, this new metadata integrity um, backend is that you can actually add your own metadata integrity checks. 
So if you define a naming convention, for example, that specifies never prefix your data elements number of, you could actually develop your own uh, integrity checks that will flag all the all the metadata that starts with a uh, number of, for example. Then there are some things you need to just review, uh, like having category options that are actually the same thing, but defined twice. Uh, data integrity checks will not pick up those. It will pick up categories where all the options are the same. So whatever can be automated, the integrity check will pick up. But it doesn't understand that five years and above and five years plus is the same thing. So that's stuff that requires manual uh, reviews. I think a challenge we have now with this metadata integrity is that we have more more ways of finding issues, but we don't really have that many more ways of resolving them. Uh, and but that's a that is a priority. Uh, I mean, there are some things that are quite straightforward. You can go into the maintenance app and resolve it quite easily. Some other checks uh, now have some guidance in the description of the issue that will tell you, okay, you have uh, space in front of all these names. You can use a SQL query to remove them like this. So there is a little bit of guidance in some of the checks. There are also some things that are really difficult to resolve. And we don't really have good like step-by-step -step instructions of how it can be done. Uh, but it is something that is a priority. And um, in the roadmap now, there is new functionality in development for merging duplicates, for example, for uh, data elements, indicators, indicator types, category options, uh, and org units. So there is stuff happening. Uh, but it's we're sort of a long way from where we can resolve all the issues we are able to identify um, in an easy way. Just one one slide on users. Uh, I think SOPs are important here as well. That's in a way the main thing. Uh, as your system grows, you have maybe a few tens of, tens of thousands of users, maybe you have decentralized uh, user management, you really need to have SOPs in place so that this is done in a consistent and secure way. Uh, in environments where you have lots of DHS2 instances, there is, of course, also the, the possibility of using single sign-on, which would reduce the complexity for the end users, probably increase it for the admins who are maintaining this. So that's sort of a trade-off. You can make it simpler for the end users and at the cost of increasing the complexity of the your sort of hosting and environment, depending on how you do it. This is sort of a continuation of the metadata stuff. Because one thing is sort of some uh, best practices around uh, how you set up your metadata, how you identify issues. But then the question is, how do you uh, actually change your metadata in a way that is, uh, is hopefully sort of secure in the sense of not messing up your uh, system further? Uh, and there, it's sort of about change management. Um, and as the complexity increases, this becomes even more uh, important. So with this change management, uh, I mean, basic thing is that you should have some system in place for tracking issues. Um, like for software, we have Jira. Uh, you need to have a process where you actually specify the requirements, what needs to be changed, who approves it. Uh, you need to have a way of making changes in a way that you can reproduce. You need to have a way of testing your changes. And you need to have a way of deploying them in production. So this is sort of uh, all the aspects of metadata management, uh, how we actually make those changes in a responsible way.
So, I mean, in terms of Bob and Tito, you talked a bit about having like staging instances and test instances and some of the challenges uh, of doing that in large systems. But you should really have a production instance, a test instance, and a development instance um, in all implementations. Um, because you want to be able to make changes, work on changes over time without affecting the production system. You need to be able to test and quality assure the changes without affecting the production system. You need to be able to do some performance testing without affecting the production system, uh, be able to document the changes. Um, one key thing here is, of course, that uh, if you want your tests to be uh, good, you need to be testing on something that is as new copy of production as possible. If you're testing in a test environment that was a copy of production from two years ago, it doesn't really tell you whether it will work when you apply it in uh, the real production system. Uh, in some cases, is that setting up these testing environments can be even more complicated than just taking a copy because you might have to uh, remove some of the sensitive data before you can actually make it available to the people who are doing the testing. I mean, I won't go through all this, but just an idea of common sort of instances environments you should have available with the development environment, testing environment, production, uh, and ideally also separate training environment. In many cases, that's one source of metadata chaos in production is that you're doing training hundreds of users in production. They're adding their adding dashboards, adding visualizations, uh, adding lots of stuff just for training purposes, and uh, it's never uh, cleaned up afterwards. So if you have this uh, environments, where do you actually make your changes? I think this is some people can agree or disagree, but I would say if it relates to the input, tracker configuration, data set configuration, or if you're deleting stuff, whether it's data or metadata, you really should do that first in a development environment. You should test it, and then you should apply it in production. If you're making changes to the outputs, which happens all the time with users making their own visualizations and dashboards and everything, of course, that's they need to be able to do that in the system that they are they are actually using. This is maybe something in between. If you have like a set of public dashboards for all users that the national core team is developing, those you might want to change in the development environment and test before you uh, apply the changes. And of course, you should be very sure that things work before you uh, apply this in, uh, in production. I think I'll move uh, quickly now so we have some time at the end for um, discussion. But I mean, this when you're doing changes in production, they should ideally be reproducible. You should work in development. You have made some changes. Maybe it's a new data set. Maybe you're changing some uh, indicators. You should ideally have those in a script, uh, or at least you should have like a step-by-step, -step, I need to import this, then I need to change this. You need to run this SQL query. Documented, try it in the testing environment. If it doesn't work, you should be able to go back and adjust, try it again. If it works, fine, then you are ready to move to um, production. And you really need to have some way of testing this. Uh, so is the stuff you're working on possible to test so that you can make sure it works? Uh, are you able to test it not just with your super user account, but also with the accounts of the people in the doing data entry, for example, and make sure it works for them? And then sort of a checklist. When can you then apply your changes to production? Well, when you've tested them, when they've been approved, when users are actually informed that there will be changes, if you have anything sort of end user, uh, end user facing changes, 
uh, and only if you are able to roll back if something goes wrong. I was sort of referring to metadata changes when I talked about this change management, but I, I mean, a lot of the same applies to doing software upgrades that you need to have your test environment. You need to be able to test not with your, just with your super user account, but also with other user accounts. Um, and you need to have a process of informing users that there will be changes, etc. So a lot of that is the same. Just highlighting some things, which is, it is a challenge that many implementations are using unsupported versions of DHIS2. And that's a problem because, well, sort of the obvious, they miss out on new features, new performance improvements, as a jump. But it's also problematic because uh, of security fixes, for example, if you have a tracker implementation using uh, the DHIS2 version that doesn't get security fixes, that's a, that's a problem. And I would say it's also easier to try to sort of continuously implement smaller changes than waiting five years and then trying to jump 10 versions uh, where there is like really major changes to the uh, database schema and to all the apps, etc. Again, this is an area where you really should have some SOPs saying this is how we do upgrades for our implementation. This is how we test. This is how we uh, deploy. Uh, major upgrades are, of course, the most uh, most critical to plan and test the upgrades. Uh, ideally, you do the, all the metadata integrity checks before you try to upgrade. Because that's one thing that could break the upgrade is that you have metadata issues to begin with. And that was not sort of taken uh, into account with the uh, in the upgraded code base. Uh, and I mean, this needs to be tested again on a separate environment. Minor versions should, in theory, be less uh, less complicated. There shouldn't hopefully be any changes to the data model, et cetera. Um, and hopefully you don't need to plan retraining of users because the, the changes aren't that big. Uh, but it's still critical to test in a separate environment uh, and make sure that you've actually have read the release notes, the upgrade notes, and uh, are aware of all the changes that are included. Final slide. Uh, this is something I I think is a bit new to many of the DHS2 admins, that you actually need to keep track of these uh, app updates as well now, separately from the, the core updates. Uh, so I know, at least personally, I've several times thought, ah, oh, there's something not working in Capture, for example, and then I realized I'm not actually using the latest version. Uh, I know I'm using 40.3, but I don't have the latest app version. Um, so I think it's just something that needs to be uh, on people's mind that they need to go in here and actually check if there are updates to the apps. They need to see what are actually the changes. Is it something that the end users will notice? So they need to inform them, uh, etc. That's it. And that was a quick, quick, um, quick about everything. Hello. Olaf there uh, wagging his finger at us. But I mean, I don't know. Responses, thoughts? Yeah. Sorry, just a follow up point to that. And I think that governance thing is really, really important. I think I'm working in a number of years. And one of the nice things is that local teams at the point where they can migrate. 
So all of those external consultants only have access to the development server. Everything they do, they only get to see the development server. Final going live. And that really does stop that chaos because you're right, people coming in with all sorts of so do not allow your metadata file sort of answers that question that way. Cleaning that stuff. Completely clean. Often do that if the definition is the same. Aren't migrating into the new metadata. Bring it under the fault instead of the right pattern. Just really make sure. Often much easier when I clean up an old system. The same with the background as well. But I think you may be close to that. Thanks. Uh, uh, so I, I agree with, you know, we need tools to fix things, but there are certain situations. Why do we even allow those issues to come in? Parents within the same with the same name. Or what? Why would you have two facilities with the same name? Surprisingly enough, I think that some of the stuff we see fire implementation guides for track. That actually has making your metadata management right. My name is Martin and I'm from MSH. I think we are going back to the same uh, conundrum because every time we think we're trying to make something easy, we're actually building a big concern. The maintenance app has given uh, people this the feeling of I can go and create a category option and you know, create a category and put the data element and put this all together and do it. But we, we are not, we have made it quite, quite a, very easy for them, to, for them to believe that I can actually create a data set and capture it. But we are not telling them the complexity of what's happening behind them. And personally, I mean, for the last two decades, I've used uh, DHIS2. This extent, I've got to the point where I'm telling people we cannot have all these cooks in the same kitchen. I don't know whether you put the salt or you put more chili or you really didn't even add anything. So I put chili because I like salt. My wife adds salt, my daughter adds salt because they all can get into the kitchen. Then we get to the whole integrity issues later. So we need to first get back and say, as much as we are going to break these tools, I wish sure that the person who is going to receive this tool might be able to understand what it means. If you say, oh, I've found 10 users, I can merge them into one. Oh, go ahead, merge on the users. Because it's just a click, 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 click. But what is happening here? We are not really trying to tell them the complexity of what it is. And these are some of the things I've tried to say. Where I work. I mean, the problem is, I mean, we, we, we've really improved our quality testing stuff a lot. But you just can't. Just want to just want to add to that one that that's why we have the beta testing program. And that's why we want people to be in that program to take your production data, run it on the point zero version and tell us what. Cases, yeah, yeah. Probably not going to pay for all of us. Other people control the money. It's not me. Thanks very much, everybody.